Thanks, Andy. This morning, as we continue in our We Believe series, we are uh, thinking together about what we believe, what we proclaim about baptism and about church membership. And as we begin, I invite you to open the scriptures again to Acts chapter 2. The text we'll, we'll start with this morning. Acts 2 is that uh, Pentecost sermon, uh, the first Christian sermon that Peter proclaimed there on the day of Pentecost. Uh, Matt alluded to it last week, a sermon somewhat infamously begins, uh, brothers, we are not drunk. Uh, We're going to go to the the conclusion of that message this morning, Acts 2, beginning with verse 36. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children And for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone in need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Would you pray with me? Lord, we thank you for the promise of the gospel, for these first hearers, and for their children, and for those like us who are far off. God, we thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit. We thank you for the gift of baptism. We thank you for the gift of your church. God, we thank you for the gift of the word. And we pray that as we open it, as we consider it together, you would transform us and make us more like you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. As we look at baptism and at church membership, I want to begin, uh, as we have for these last couple of sessions, with some words from that 1963 Baptist Faith and Message. Uh, if you picked up a handout in the, in the back, they're printed for you there. Uh, but here's a, a succinct summary of, of where we land on these important questions for our life together. A document says, Christian baptism is the immersion of a believer in water in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's an act of obedience, symbolizing the believer's faith in a crucified, buried, and risen Savior, the believer's death to sin, the burial of the old life, and the resurrection to walk in newness of life in Christ Jesus, is a testimony to his faith in the final resurrection of the dead. Being a church ordinance is prerequisite to the privileges of church membership and to the Lord's Supper. And then the article on the church says this, a New Testament church of the Lord Jesus Christ is a local body of baptized believers who are associated by covenant in the faith and fellowship of the gospel, observing the two ordinances of Christ, committed to his teachings, exercising the gifts, rights, and privileges invested in them by his word, and seeking to extend the gospel to the ends of the earth. The New Testament speaks also of the church as the body of Christ, which includes all the redeemed of all the ages. You've got local and specific, and and you've got broad, uh, extending across time and across space. Baptism, uh, the distinct markers of baptism for our own tradition are baptism by immersion and baptism of confessing believers. Uh, The immersion bit is fairly straightforward. Uh, We baptize by immersion uh, because that's the simple meaning of the word baptize. Uh, If you were to to translate it out very literally, it would mean something like uh, to immerse or to to dip. 
several years ago, I visited the Antietam battlefield in, in Maryland. And there, one of the, the landmarks of that historic place is a church right there on the battlefield, uh, just across from the visitor center, uh, this 19th century church that stood there during the, the battlefield. And ever since that time, it has been known as the Dunker Church. Uh, I kind of scratched my head about this a little bit. I, I should have known as a good Baptist. Uh, they were called this in reflection of their baptismal practice. It was a group of uh, German immigrant believers there, some of the, the Pennsylvania Dutch, I guess they'd, they'd wandered down across the state line into Maryland establish a church. They were known as the Dunkers because they baptized by immersion, uh, believing that was the, the truest representation of that, of that biblical picture. Uh, since that time, that, that group has gone through some name changes. Uh, uh, I guess they decided Dunkers was a little too on the nose. Uh, they were known as the German Baptists for a while. Uh, now they go by Church of the Brethren, but their baptismal practice has remained the same and Insofar as that goes, I say we are with them. Uh, we, are the, we are the dunkers of Waco. Uh, this practice, uh, along with just being a, a literal rendering of the word for baptize, uh, is also, I think, the clearest picture of some of the, the imagery in Scripture about baptism and about what it means. Uh, we'll return to some of these portraits in, in a moment, but, but pictures of burial and resurrection, pictures of washing, of cleansing, um, I think going down fully into the waters uh, captures that and portrays it as a, as a visible witness. Uh, we're not alone in this. Over the last 60 years or so, there's actually been a growing movement in uh, other churches, other traditions. Uh, the Roman Catholic Church, the Episcopal Church uh, have actually become more and more interested in immersion baptism. Uh, in my in my doctor of ministry program, uh, many of my classmates are Episcopalians. And uh, as we were together for one of our seminars, we started talking about this question about baptism. And, and they were all in on the idea of immersion, but they just couldn't wrap their minds around the, the practicalities of it. And they said, you know, we, we would like to have this symbolism, but we also want to be able to baptize in our, in our buildings, these spaces where we gather for other acts of worship. And they just couldn't figure out the plumbing of it. They were baffled by the architecture, the engineering. They said, you know, are, are we going to bring in a trough? You know, would we, do we need a clawfoot tub? It's almost like we need a, a tank built into the room. And there, there's just, there's no way this could ever, could ever work. What are we going to do? I said, oh boy, it's time for the Baptist boy to shine. Y'all sit down. I'm, I'm going to explain some things. So we talked about that. I sent them some catalogs from, from Baptist architecture services. We'll, we'll see if a revival breaks out among our, our more liturgical friends. Uh, but there is this recognition of, of that picture of going down into the water and something happening there so that when you come out, uh, you have been transformed, you have been changed. Along with immersion, uh, the other hallmark of our Baptist practice is that we practice baptism of believers. Uh, we think that baptism is an act of obedience uh, that should be consciously, voluntarily undertaken. Uh, we baptize folks of a huge span of ages, uh, but we do so on their profession of faith in Christ as Lord and Savior. Uh, again, this was the practice of the earliest church as best we can reconstruct. Uh, from the pages of scripture itself, that, that very early church, and then uh, for about 130 years after that time, uh, it seemed that believer's baptism was the norm. Uh, there's actually a piece in the biblical or archaeological review. Uh, I'm, I'm not bright enough to subscribe to such an erudite publication, uh, but my wife is, and so from time to time I'll find one laying around the house and pick it up. Uh, I, was, I was leafing through the current issue, and, and they had an article about the origins of infant baptism, and lo and behold, of all things, it emerged in a pandemic. Uh, we can all relate to that a bit. Uh, during the, the 160s, uh, during the reign of Marcus Aurelius, grave pandemic uh, swept through the Mediterranean world. Uh, huge mortality rates of all ages, and, and people were worried about their kids. They were worried about their children, some of, some of the folks most vulnerable to that illness. Uh, 
I resonated with this as I read it. I thought back to those uh, early days of our own pandemic when I had an infant five or six months old at home and that, that fear and concern. Um, these folks in the Roman Empire were worried uh, not just for the, the physical health and wellness of their children, but they were worried about their eternity. Uh, again, as good parents should be, uh, but their solution to that became to adapt the baptismal practice they said, uh, you know, if baptism is good for adults, it, it must be even better for kids, and, and started that practice of baptizing infants in a, in a really kind of unprecedented way uh, to that point. While I can resonate and empathize with that, that impulse of a parent, of a dad, uh, to take care of his kids, uh, I don't think we can let our anxieties about things like this determine our doctrines. Uh, so we go back to to scripture and we see this pattern of baptism by believers on profession of their faith. As believers are baptized, uh, they are baptized not just into Christ, but into the church. Uh, just as birth places us within families, this rebirth of baptism places us within the community of faith. And that's ultimately why we also believe uh, as an outcome of this in the church governed by the congregation. I think if people are responsible enough to make a decision for Christ, uh, they're also prepared to handle the day-to-day -day operations and business of the church. Uh, if you can decide to place your faith in Jesus as Savior and Lord, uh, I can't imagine a weightier decision that would be off limits for you. Uh, we'll return to that a bit next week as we talk about church governance and how we organize and implement some of this life together. Uh, but these all, these all hold together. They all interconnect. Now, those passages from the Baptist faith and message are uh, valuable because they are so concise. Uh, some of their beauty is in their brevity. B.C. Crushwitz and Herschel Hobbes and, and other friends that helped put those together, uh, they distilled down a lot of doctrine into just a few paragraphs, a few sentences even. Uh, the Holy Spirit, on the other hand, was not nearly so concise about some of this. Uh, we got a whole book explaining these things. So it can be a bit of a puzzle uh, for a time like this with limited time to think about what text we're going to look at. As Scripture talks about baptism, it does so through a series of pictures, a series of images. Uh, we believe that what the Lord does for us in baptism is big enough and beautiful enough that it can't really be captured with a, a single portrayal. Uh, somewhat analogous to how we have four Gospels giving four perspectives on the life of Jesus that mutually inform one another and, and give us a fuller picture of who he is. Scattered through Scripture, we have a whole host of snapshots of baptism, different metaphors, different images of of what's happening as we take somebody down into that water, as we immerse them, as we, as we draw them out again. So I want to talk about just a few of those uh, briefly, drawing on some of the texts that Matt has, has read for us. First of all, uh, probably the most common picture of baptism is of death, burial, and resurrection. This is reflected in our practice and in, in how we even narrate that practice as we baptize someone within our congregation. Uh, we will typically say something along the lines of, on profession of your faith in Christ as Savior and Lord, we baptize you in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, buried with Christ in baptism, and raised to walk in newness of life. This picture of death and burial and resurrection uh, looks really to the past, the present, and the future. Uh, part of that, we are recalling Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, uh, that world-changing event of the gospel that makes all of this possible. Uh, we look back to Christ's time on the cross, his time in the tomb, and, and that Easter resurrection. We also deal in the present. We believe upon that faith in Christ, uh, that that person being baptized has been buried with him and is raised to walk in newness of life. That's the, that's the sort of present tense promise that, that our language narrates in that moment. We also look ahead to that promise of the gospel for, 
or ultimate final resurrection. Uh, as we go in those waters, it's a reminder of our mortality and that uh, even within Christ, most of us will eventually go down into our own graves, but, but through the promise of the gospel, we will be raised into fullness of life with Christ fully. Baptism pictures death, burial, and resurrection. It also pictures washing, pictures cleansing. It's a bath. As we go down into the water, we are, we are reminded, uh, as the Acts passage said to us, that our sins are being washed away. We are being made new. We are being made cleansed. Uh, there's that, that bathing image. Uh, it also evokes some of the image of the, the ritual purifications, the ritual baths that would happen in the Old Testament as people would come and go from the temple. Uh, there were all sorts of traditions of, of baptisms to prepare to come into the presence of a holy God. Baptism draws on that image and enriches it, strengthens it. For that reason, I think, uh, just like every time we come to the dinner table, we ought to be reminded of the Lord's table, the bread and the wine. In the same way, every time we enter the bath, we ought to think back to our baptism. Uh, what a way to begin the day, thinking of how Christ has cleansed us and made us new. Now, some people can take this to, uh, to some impressive lengths. Uh, our own pastor likes to go and take a dip in the pool every, every now and then uh, to start the day in the morning, go out, get the blood flow. He's, he's been uh, boasting a bit recently as the weather starts to turn or at least gives us hints that it's going to about how here in Texas he can enjoy that pool on to Thanksgiving, to Christmas, to New Year's. Uh, as, it, as it gets closer to New Year's, it gets, it gets a little more invigorating, a little more reviving. Uh, Eugene Peterson uh, theologian, translator of the message, uh, he adopted this practice. He would go out for a morning dip, but rather than doing it in a, in a backyard pool in Texas, he would do it in a lake in Montana. Uh, he would go out every day of the year, and uh, I just don't have that commitment to go and immerse myself in February in Montana. But Eugene did, and as he did so, uh, he was not re-baptizing himself day by day, uh, much the contrary. He would say uh, there was one baptism for forgiveness of sins and entry into the church, but he was recalling every morning that baptism. He was going back in his mind and his heart to that place and saying, this is a new day the Lord has made, and, and I need to be made new to be fit for it. Uh, it became an occasion for prayer for him, an occasion for fellowship with the Holy Spirit, and, uh, and an occasion to really get the blood pumping and be ready to tackle whatever came next. Uh, I hope what came next was a hot cup of coffee for him. Baptism pictures washing. It pictures cleansing. It also pictures birth and rebirth. Uh, remember as, as Nicodemus came to Jesus and, and asked, what do, what do I make of you, Jesus? What, what am I supposed to do? And Jesus tells him, you must be born again. Nicodemus was a practical-minded guy. He scratched his head at this. He said, hey, I, I know how birth happens. I'm, I'm probably a dad myself. I, I'm not going back to be born a second time. Jesus said, no, I'm talking about being born of the Spirit. In our sermon from last Sunday from John, it talked about that testimony of the Spirit and the water and the blood. Uh, part of this uh, being reborn is a picture of birth. Uh, the early church recognized this to the point that some of their earliest baptistries uh, were actually fashioned, sculpted to resemble a womb. Uh, as people went into them and, and came out from them again, it was a, a visual picture, frankly kind of a startling one, of being born again. These are just a few of the snapshots, and, and you can see uh, how they all inform and enrich one another. Uh, if we just planted our flag wholly at one of them to the neglect of the rest, uh, it would begin to distort. But taken together, uh, they work in dialogue. They make this, this mosaic sort of picture uh, depicting the fullness of what God wants to do for us in and through our baptism. And in baptism, we are brought into the church. Uh, the last thing that the Lord wants is uh, for baptism just to create a bunch of 
autonomous individual Christians at large. Uh, sometimes this is sort of a caricature of a, our own Baptist tradition that, that we're all just utterly free to do our own thing, totally unconstrained by any concern for anybody but ourselves. That's the furthest thing from the truth. In 1 Corinthians 12, 13, Paul writes, we were all baptized by one spirit so as to form one body. According to this text, part of the whole purpose of baptism is to bring us together. Baptism is a picture of birth. Each person born is born into a family. They've got at least a mama, hopefully a daddy too, hopefully grandparents and aunts and uncles and cousins. Well, in the same way as we are reborn in baptism, we're born into the church. We see this in the Acts passage. Verse 41 those who accepted Peter's message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Uh, indicates there was already a, a recognized congregation, a recognized church of people who had trusted Jesus as Lord. And these 3,000 who were added to them were added to them. Uh, they joined this body and identified with it. So how does this work practically in our own practice? Well, here at First Baptist Waco, we have four pathways towards membership. There's, there's four uh, on-ramps, so to speak, if you want to become one of us. Uh, the first one is what we have been talking about this whole time, profession of faith in Christ as Savior and as Lord, and subsequent baptism as a believer. Uh, this is the way that excites us the most to welcome new people uh, to our congregation. When we have a chance to welcome them, into our fellowship, but also welcome them into the wider kingdom of God. That is a joy and a gift. A second way that people can join us is what we call transfer of letter. Uh, folks who come to us from another Baptist congregation uh, profess their faith in Christ and their, their prior experience of believer's baptism. Come, they may have moved from one place to another. They may simply be uh, changing within the same town. They say, hey, we we have a responsibility to one another as part of this wider church. And so we want to we wanna hand off that responsibility of, of shepherding and caring for one another. And that church letter is how we do that. Now, sometimes people get anxious about this. They think there's a, an actual physical document that's lost in a drawer somewhere. Uh, they, they think they may have to go hunt down their church letter like they need to hunt down their blockbuster card or something like that. Uh, no, this is communication handled between the two churches. Uh, we help people along with that. It's simply an affirmation of, hey, we know this person. We are testifying to their sincere faith in the Lord, and we have shepherded them for this season. Uh, now through changes in their life, they're affiliating with this congregation. We want to make that hand off well. Uh, the last thing that we want to do is, is fumble a person as they move from, from one place to another. So the transfer of letter is one of the ways we do that. The third way that people can join our church is by statement. Uh, <clears throat> there are times that uh, they are coming from a church that may not handle the, the church letter exactly as we do. There are times, uh, recent memory, people have joined our church coming from a fellow Baptist congregation that, that simply no longer exists. Uh, their church had, had dissolved uh, for one reason or another. So in that case, they simply affirm their faith in Christ and their experience of believer's baptism. Folks, do that and come to us. We will take them at their word, and we will receive them gladly. And then finally, the last, the last pathway to membership, a uh, bit of a different category, what we call watch care. This is a long tradition in Baptist life. Uh, from time to time, people find themselves in a circumstance uh, where they may be displaced for a time. Uh, they may be a church member in Oklahoma City or Tulsa or Little Rock or you name it, but they're going to be spending time in Waco. Uh, we deal with this every single year with college students coming to Waco. Uh, they have a church home where they want to keep that membership and identity, uh, but they also realize we're going to be here and we need to have a church family in McLennan County. Uh, people deal with this through work situations. We've had folks come to us uh, through military assignment. We've had folks uh, working for TxDOT, repairing I-35, and they say, 
we're not here forever and ever, but we're here for now, and we want to make the most of it. And so Watch Care allows a, a sort of dual citizenship of your church membership. Uh, there is also a category of Watch Care for folks that uh, are here, gladly, joyfully want to be part of this congregation, uh, but disagree with us on a few secondary doctrinal issues. Uh, quite honestly, baptism is probably the most frequent one. Uh, they say, we're with you, we want to be part of you, but we don't see totally eye to eye on this or this. Uh, in that case, we welcome people to join us with Watch Care. Uh, say, you are part of us, we are part of you. Uh, you may not be able to fully participate in, in every leadership role uh, that another member would have, uh, but we want to walk alongside you as sisters and brothers and claim you as one of our own. So those are the four paths. Those are our four practices as we welcome people through baptism into the life of the church. I think we see something very similar to this in that, in that Pentecost text. After recording the, the baptism of these 3,000, uh, just an astronomical, exponential growth of the church, uh, we might find ourselves asking, well, what did these people do then? What did they get up to? Well, Scripture tells us. We get this beautiful summary text at the end of Acts 2. It's one of my favorite parts of all Scripture. It talks about how the people devoted themselves to a number of things. They committed themselves together to the apostles' teaching. Uh, we are still able to do that now. We have the apostles' teaching, even if we don't have the apostles, recorded in the word of Scripture. And we gather around it week by week. Uh, that's why... Scripture is the centerpiece of all that we do here. It's the, it's the center of our worship on Sunday morning, and in this hour, it's the, the curriculum for every Sunday school class that we have. We devote ourselves to that teaching of the apostles. We also devote ourselves to fellowship. We devote ourselves to, to being together, to caring for one another, to enjoying, encouraging one another. We devote ourselves to the breaking of the bread, Again, this can be the most mundane of things, but I also cannot believe that as Luke wrote this in Acts, he wasn't thinking of that gift of bread and cup and the Lord's Supper. I think uh, it was both and. He was talking about some, some fellowship hall meals, and he was talking about the meal that makes us the church. I think those earliest believers wouldn't have, wouldn't have seen a real bright line distinguishing between those two. And they devoted themselves to prayer. They committed to pray and give thanks and confession and rejoicing and appeals, crying out for help and celebration. They prayed together. These first four things they devoted themselves to are all kind of what we might think of as churchy things. These were religious sort of things that religious sort of people do. But it couldn't help but spill over into their ethical practice of their, their daily ways of walking in the world. These early believers undertook a process of, of mutual material caretaking for one another. Acts tells us how they held their possessions in common and, and shared with each other. It's a practice that we continue to do today. Just today, we're, we're taking a box of food to a church member who's, who's found himself in a situation where getting groceries is is a prohibitive hindrance right now. We said, we're not going to let that be a problem for you. We're going to come alongside you and look after you because there's going to be another season where you're going to look after one of us. It's part of what we do as the church that makes us who we are. It's a, it's a practice that defines us. But this isn't just a matter of external action either. Part of what baptism makes us to be are people with particular attitudes. As this early church did this, they broke bread in their homes, ate together with glad and sincere hearts. People didn't just do these things, they enjoyed doing these things. They didn't fellowship because Acts 2.42 told them they had to, they did it because they wanted to. They couldn't imagine life any other way. And this sort of goodwill spilled over beyond their boundaries, into their neighbors. Again, kind of a 
despicable caricature of baptism and church membership is it's, it's putting up some kind of fence to say, oh, you're in and you're out. And, uh, you know, we've, we've made our club and we've held up our sign, no fill in the blank allowed. We always want to welcome people in. We also always want our love to abound and overflow. That final verse of the chapter, as the people praised God, they enjoyed the favor of all the people. Our friend David Garland says uh, maybe a better translation of this is favor toward the people. Uh, again, I'm inclined to take it as a both and. I think, I think that early church had good regard and, and positive favor toward their neighbors. I think because of that, those neighbors couldn't help but have some positive dispositions toward them. And then finally, uh, the last item, if, if you just took these first seven, uh, it would be tempting to take this as a, as a to-do list. I'm a list maker. I, I have lists of the lists that I need to make. Uh, it, it helps me order my life, and, and with two young kids, I need all the order that I can impose on myself. But the temptation of that, and it, it's a tendency I fall prey to, is to make the list and, and decide, these are the things that I've got to accomplish on my own. I start every day with a list. I've got to knock this out, this out, this out. And quite frankly, if you looked at this list of the apostles' teaching and breaking bread and caring for people in need and having goodwill in the community, it could be pretty tiring pretty quick. If these were things that we were called to do on our own power, it would just honestly be exhausting. It might start out as a whole lot of fun, but about day four, you might be sick of it. So that's why I'm so thankful for that final sentence of Acts 2. The Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Reflects that earlier, earlier language of the 3,000 who were added to their number that day. I think, I think Luke got to the end of the chapter and realized, I've got to just make very plain what I had implicit at the start. Uh, I said they were added. Now I've got to let people know who's doing the adding. It's the Lord that adds to our number because it's also the Lord in our midst working through our eyes and ears and hands and feet that do all the rest of this. Because we've gone into those waters of baptism and been raised to walk in newness of life, because our, our lives are hid within Christ, we're able to do all of these things with freedom and with joy. And that's a real hopeful word for the middle of the week. I'm thankful for it. I'm thankful for each one of you. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we give you thanks that you have called us to be your people. God, we thank you for calling us to yourself and giving us new life through faith and baptism. God, we thank you for giving us to one another. Lord, we thank you that you have brought us into a community, uh, one that at some level we chose, but at a deeper, richer way, you chose and created for us. God, we pray that you would strengthen us to live into it fully. God, would you make us the people that you have called us to be? God, would you remind us day by day of our baptism? God, would you strengthen us to do the things that you call us to? In Christ's name we pray. Amen.